This is week three of the Women of the Bible Study. Uh, we're going to be looking at Rebecca. So we're going to start out. Um, initially, when I, I thought about Rebecca, I'm like, well, this will be quick. I, I, I might be able to do Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel all in one week. And then I started studying, and I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, so we're going to start out in, in Genesis chapter 24. If you want to turn there, um, the situation to lay a little bit of the backstory is that Abraham was getting old and um, advanced in age, whatever that meant in his day and age. Um, and the Lord had blessed him, and so he calls in his servant, his chief steward. Okay, this this guy would be. A little bit like what Joseph was to Potiphar. You know, remember when Joseph rises to power, he's head of Potiphar's household to the point where Potiphar doesn't take any, he doesn't think about it at all. He just leaves every decision in Joseph's hands. This is what that servant was, in essence, to Abraham. So he calls this guy in and says, you know, he makes him swear, take, take an oath to him and says, you're going to go back to my homeland and you're going to find a wife for my son Isaac, okay? So the servant was like, well, what if she won't come? And Abraham says, look, in verse 7, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, to your descendants I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be free from my oath. Only do not take my son back there. Okay, so he wasn't allowed to take Isaac with him. His job was to be open to what the Lord was showing him, and his job was to find a wife, okay? This is not match.com. <laughs> or some of these other dating sites. And again, this culture was very, very different. I don't know all the ins and outs of the betrothal and all that kind of stuff. I know there's a bride price that has to be paid and all that. And these marriages were arranged. They weren't, oh, let's fall in love, you know. That, that was not the issue. This was, this was your parents made these arrangements for you. They took a wife for you in most cases. So the servant goes and he is, he is tasked with this. He takes 10 camels and a whole bunch of stuff and heads out toward Mesopotamia to the city of, to the city of Nahor. Okay. So he gets to a well and he makes the camels lay down and he decides, you know, it's, it's, he's by the, the city well. It's evening time. It's time to water the animals. And he, just, he, he offers up a prayer in verse 12. <laughs> and he says, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Now he's not saying that the Lord was his God. He's saying the Lord, he's appealing to the relationship between Yahweh and Abraham. I don't know where his faith was. Hopefully it was in the Lord, but he... Um, appeals to the Lord and says, Behold, I am standing at the spring, and the daughters of the men are coming out to draw the water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, Drink, and I will water your camels also. This is what we call a fleece, right? It reminds you of Gideon, okay? If this happens, then this. So he's, he's, he's throwing this out there. Because it's really, honestly, at this point, probably the only option he has to, to in terms of his prayer. You know, if, if, if certain things are done, then he was very specific about it, wasn't he? It wasn't just that she give me water, but that she also freely offers to, without provocation, to water the camels. Now, that, that's probably a task, okay, because camels drink how much water? When they're drinking, they drink a lot, okay? All right. Um, 
So here she comes, verse 15. It came about before he had even finished speaking. Isn't that amazing? Before the words are out of his mouth all the way, here comes Rebecca. <clears throat> now, what we learn in verse 15 is that she was born to, uh, I'm going to do my best here, Bethuel and uh, the son of Milka, um, the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. So they went, makes them what? Cousins? Something like that. So she comes out with a jar on her shoulder. So it's one of the things that she was coming to do was get water from the well. So the servant runs up to her and says, please let me drink a little water from your jar. Now, I don't know if you're a woman. Now, again, I'm, I'm kind of projecting here. If a guy runs up to me, I'm, my initial reaction is, dude, who are you and what do you want? You know, I'm ready to do a little kung fu, you know. But um, he runs up to her and she, he asks for a drink of water. She says, drink, my Lord. So she already had water in the jar. And she lowered the jar to her, to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw without provocation here, folks. He, he doesn't ask, he doesn't, the, the Holy Spirit must have put this on her heart. I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw and she drew for all his camels. That was no small task. Okay. Meanwhile, he's gazing at her quietly. And he's just trying to figure out if this really was the one, if his journey was successful or not. Okay? And that, isn't that often like us too, where we say, okay, Lord, if you want me to do this, and this, and this, then this, and this, and this, and then when this, this, and this happens, we're like, well, did I hear this right? Did I get this right? I better double check. And that's not always a bad thing. It came about when they had finished drinking that he takes a gold ring, it weighs half a shekel, and two bracelets uh, that weighed 10 shekels in gold, big honk and things, I guess, um, and gives them to her. And he says, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? So he's asking about what family she's from. And back then in, de in those days, they didn't have Ramadas. They didn't have Hilton's Lego Classier or Starwood. And when you're traveling in those days, you went to the city square, which is where the, apparently the well was, and then whoever came to you first was obligated, really obligated, to provide you lodging. Wow. Okay, this is like Mennonite your way, but the Jewish your way. Um, you guys don't know what Mennonite your way is, but um, a cheap way to travel. But, you know, they would take you in and provide hospitality for you. Hospitality was a big deal in that culture. Okay, so, you know, she, he's asking to stay with her family. And um, she says, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of uh, Milcah, who she bored in Nahor. And he's like, and she said, we have plenty of, of straw feed and room for you to lodge. So he bows down and he worships the <coughs> Lord because he realizes right then and there, the Lord has answered his prayer and his mission has been successful. And he declares that in worship, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward his master, to my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. So off she goes, she runs and tells her, her mother's household about these things. And she has a brother who um, we'll hear about next week, Laban. Um, yeah, he's an interesting dude. And he comes out and he welcomes, he welcomes them in. He sees the, the ring and the bracelets on her wrist and, and, uh, he realizes something's up. Okay. Cause that's kind of a down payment on a dowry right there on a bride price. Um, and he welcomes him in, in verse 31, come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? prepared the place and all that so they go in and 
and um, you know everything gets settled they get settled down and um, he begins to explain the situation and he asks you know I'm not going to read it all again because it's it's repetitious from the first time but he explains his, his mission to Laban and the family so I'm here to get a bride for Isaac <coughs> and Rebecca is the one that I'm looking at here and so um, when we head over to verse 50, he wants to know um, if they would agree to allowing Rebecca to be the one that he's chosen. Verse 50, and Laban and Bethuel um, answer, the matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you good or bad. Now that's an interesting statement because what, one of the things that we'll learn later on about Laban is he was not necessarily a worshiper of Yahweh okay he had household idols if you remember when Jacob leaves um, Rachel takes some of the household idols with her steals them and Laban accuses them of stealing them <coughs> so Laban is not a worshiper of Yahweh he he has a fear of gods and so he's hearing about Yahweh for the first time He's like, mm, okay, because this matter came from a God named Yahweh, okay, it's, it's his choice, not ours. It's kind of a, it's not necessarily something he believed, it's just something he, he, he says this. Um, in verse 51, behold, Rebecca is before you, take her and go, let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. I think what was really motivating him was the gold bracelet and the gold rings, okay? He knew this guy was going to be able to pay a bride price more than anything else. So it came about when Abraham's servant heard the words that he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. He brings out articles of silver, articles of gold, garments, gives them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother, okay? So yeah. This is a business transaction, isn't that lovely? Um, and here the men who are with them, they eat and they drink, they spend the night. He gets up to, to leave, he says, send me away to my master. They want him to stay for about 10 days. They want to delay. The guy's like, no, the Lord has given me success, let me go. And then they, they turn to her. They, the verse 57, this is kind of funny actually. We'll call the girl and consult her wishes. Really? So they ask Rebecca, will you go with this man? And she says, yes, I will go. And they offer up this, this blessing in verse 60, may you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands. May your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Wow, isn't that interesting? Um, and that's still the case, isn't it? She has become the mother of too many to count through Jacob. And Israel is still at war with his neighbors, but there's been more than one opportunity for them to possess the gates of those who hate them. It still is today. So in verse uh, 61, um, Rebecca, um, Mounts her camel, not a lovely way to travel, follows, follows the guy. And Isaac was going, um, he was, he came from that place that I don't, uh, Bear Lahai Roy, um, I'm not even going to try to translate that. For he was living in the land and the, the Negev, Isaac comes out to meditate, he's going out to pray, uh, he looks up. He sees the caravan coming. Uh, she sees him, and um, she dismounts from the camel, and she's like, who is this guy coming to meet us? And that's my master. She covers her veil, veils her face, excuse me, covers her face with a veil. And it's love at first sight. Isn't it so romantic? As you guys, just these ladies just love it. Just so romantic. It's a good thing. If you're going to be married, you better love each other. Um, so he brings her into his tent, takes her as his wife, and he's comforted after his mother's death. So we see that it was 
breaking the princess bride, true love, and <laughs> and a wonderful thing. What do we know about? Again, I'm jumping ahead. One. What do we know about Laban and the family heritage? When I think about generational passage of flesh patterns, of how to deal with things, Laban, we're going to he, he's a scoundrel, he's shrewd, he's, he's a cheat, right? Okay. Manipulator, all right? He guess what he can get, all right. Um, she learned that from him, so off we go to um, chapter 25. Sure. Go ahead. Do you think Isaac was a mama's boy? Yes, he was. <laughs> Do you think his mama doted on him? <clears throat> Do you think mom and dad were really, you know, I mean, he was, he was in essence an only child. Other than Ishmael, Ishmael was kicked out when he was 13. So from 13 on, basically, Isaac is, is the golden child, okay? And, and trust me, she, she doted on him something scary, you know? Um, where do I want to go? Okay. So is her dad dead? Nahor? Um, was he Why in the... been handling everything? Probably. He probably, he probably is the situation. Um, he would... Went to the mother and he right. Most likely, again, um, Laban has been elevated to the head of the household, mm -hmm. in essence. Um, all right, chapter 25, we're over in verse 20. <clears throat> Isaac was 40, 40 years old when he got married. Isn't that interesting? Um, when he took Rebecca, the daughter, daughter of these people that I don't really care to have to pronounce. Um, in verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was what? Barren. Seems to be a theme, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, in that day, in that medical time, they believed if a woman was barren, there had to be sin in her life. There had to be something she was doing wrong. So he prays, and the Lord answers, and Rebecca conceives. Verse 22, but the children struggled together within her. She realizes she's got something going on. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, if, if it is so, why, why then, uh, why is this going on? And she asks the Lord, bless her heart, she's learned from Isaac to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Now this is important. Remember, this was said to her. This is something she's going to hold up in her heart. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. The one shall be stronger than the older uh, than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Okay. That she never forgot. So when her days were to you know give birth, there were twins. The first one came out red, and hairy as all can be. Rosie. Red and hairy. So what do they name him? She's not Esau, <laughs> or Edom, means red. Hey, red. Hey, hairy dude. It's glad. To, I'm glad. I, okay, if you're gonna have to choose between red and hairy, red is better than being named hairy. <laughs> um, but the other one comes out holding the heel, and so they name him Jacob, which means heel catcher, which is another word for deceiver. How would you like to grow up with that name? Basically, you're a liar. <laughs> Basically, you can't be trusted. You're a conniver. You, you, you can trip somebody up. <clears throat> so the boys grew up. Esau becomes a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob becomes a peaceful man, a mama's boy living in the tents. Yeah. Now, Isaac, hey, hey, parents, what happens here? This is so easy to happen, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You got more than one kid. One favors your temperament. The other one favors dad's. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to be drawn to? 
it's 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 inevitable. It's hard for parents not to have one that they they get along with better. Um, Esau loved Esau. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, so it's appealed to the lust of the flesh. He guy, he catches game, cooks it for me. It's all good. My stomach's full. Jacob was the cook. Esau was the hunter. You know, so um, one day Esau comes in from the field. He hasn't caught anything. Jake has been cooking a stew. Esau says to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there for I'm famished. Again, you know, red stuff, you know, red stew is named red. Jacob says, first sell me your birthright. I'll give you this, but it's going to cost you. You want this? It's going to cost me. Give me on oath that you're going to give me your birthright. <laughs> Do you think that she has drilled into Jacob mm -hmm. that Jacob's going to be greater than his brother? Mm -hmm. that, that God had prophesied to her that he was going to be greater? Mm -hmm. Do you think she's conditioned him to think you got to make this happen? Mm -hmm. you got to make God's prophecy come true. you got to make it happen. He seizes on this opportunity and says, you got to sell me your birthright. Now, here's the problem with Esau. He says, what good is a birthright to me if I'm going to die? So he despised the birthright and indulged the lust of his flesh. He gave up his inheritance so flippantly for a bowl of stew. When we indulge the lust of the flesh, we're doing the same thing. Our birthright, we're settling for something so far less than what God has for us if we were willing to wait. Go ahead. Jacob had to, be, had to know about that. <clears throat> oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, she must have told him. Absolutely. This is what's going to happen. Yep. The opportunity this is what the, rises, do it. I think she probably weaned him with that information. Early on, this is what you're going to be. This is what you're going to be. You're going to be bigger, better than your brother. You're going to, he's going to serve you. Yep. He grew up here in that. Absolutely grew up here in that. So when he sees this opportunity, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to grab this for myself, and I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to appeal to the lust of his flesh because that's how I know he is, and I'm going to manipulate him. Okay? So there's two things going on here. He's... Jacob is manipulating the situation to try to make God's will happen for his life. That's not always going to work, right? Mm -hmm. But then Esau despises the Lord's will for his life, despises the birthright, indulges the lust of the flesh. It's just living in the moment, wants the things of this flesh now, thinking that will satisfy. Let's eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. When it doesn't. You know, he should have been thinking long term. One of the things that keeps us out of the trap of the lust of the flesh is when we start thinking long term, eternally, realizing the things of this world don't satisfy, the things of the Lord do. And always walking in the path of His will is the best path for us, letting Him unfold it. And He's going to bring about the prophecies Himself. But neither Jacob nor Esau really truly knew Yahweh like they, you know, like they should have. So, the transaction happens. No, wait, wait, wait. All right. Verse 27. No, chapter 27, excuse me. Isaac was old. We'll go through this rather quickly. Isaac was old. He can't see. He's got cataracts. Can't see. He realizes that his, his departure is not too far away, so he wants to make sure it's a tradition to give the blessing. The father's blessing onto the children. Okay. And so he calls his, his son to him. He calls Esau because his intent, I'm sure she's reiterated the blessing, the prophecy to Isaac, but Isaac loves Esau. And Isaac's thinking he's firstborn. He has the right. This is the culture. that He has the right to this birthright and the blessing. So Isaac calls him and says, go, go hunt some things and make some food for me. I'm going to give you my blessing. Who hears this? Rebecca. That plan is hatched. She grabs, she grabs uh, Jacob, and she's like, "We're gonna do a switcheroonie here." And Jacob's no stupid guy. He's like, "He's gonna recognize my voice. He, I'm smooth skin. 
brother's Harry. What are we going to do about this? She's like, I've got this all planned out. I've been waiting for this. She has this plan already worked out. Okay, she's going to make God's will happen here. So she kills a goat. They take the skin, the hair, the, you know, the pelt from the goat, and put it on him to make it look like he's got hairy hair, hairy arms and all that kind of stuff, right? Makes some stew. He takes it in. Isaac's like, the voice is the voice of Jacob, not of Esau, but you smell like Esau. You stink, right? And all right, so he gives in the blessing. And he basically pronounces um, over him in chapter 27, verse 28, um, 27, 28. See, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you of the dews of heaven, the fatness of the earth, and the abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you. Blessed be those who bless you. <coughs> and sure enough, as soon as he leaves, Esau comes in, finds out his blessing has been stolen, and he cries out, you know, bless me too, over in verse 39. His father says to him, behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you will live, and your brother shall you serve. But it shall come about that when you become restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Verse 41, Esau loved his brother immensely, forgave him quickly. <laughs> You're laughing. <coughs> he bore a grudge against him because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And he said to himself, the days of my uh, mourning for my father are near, and then I'm going to kill my brother. Who gets wind of that? Rebecca. Rebecca says to Isaac, in verse 46, I'm tired of living because of these daughters of Heth. Okay, what has happened is uh, Esau's married some Hittite women that drove them crazy. He did not consult mom and dad about getting these wives for him. And uh, so her daughters-in-law were driving her nuts, which is never good. And so she uses this as an excuse to uh, send Jacob back to her f homeland, back to her, her brother, to get a bride. In other words, doing the same thing that, I, uh, that Abraham had done, going to send you know, him back. So Jacob is sent away. Um, and we're going to stop there. But what I want you to see is that she never sees him again. As we, as we look forward in the story, there's, there's no reunion between Rebecca and Jacob. He's, she's not there. Her conniving, her manipulating, has created division in the family. Divided the two brothers. I'm sure Isaac was not exactly happy with her. Okay. Esau, we didn't read the text, but Esau, when, when he heard that, that Jacob had stolen this from him, he, he blames, <laughs> he already stole my birthright. No, he didn't steal it, you knucklehead. You sold it. But he was loath, he was just caught up in the anger. Okay. When we manipulate family members, does it go well for us? We may think it's in your best interest. No, it's not. Do we need to make God's will happen? No. <laughs> uh, you've heard me say it. I think I said it last time. If we get, you know, when we try to fix things, God has to fix our fix in order to fix it. Okay. When we try to make God's prophecy happen, when 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 God speaks something over us, or He speaks, you know, in His Word, you know, we can't make. If if I could make Jesus come back and get us, I would have done it. If I could have fulfilled Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Isaiah 17 and, and Zechariah, I would have already had that done so that I could be out of here. That's not, that's not our task to bring about God's will in our life. Our task is to take the next five minutes and walk in step with him and trust our family members, our kids, our, 
or, or friends or family to him. She didn't do that, and it, it created division. It made one brother want to kill the other, and she never saw her favorite son again. It cost her dearly. I wonder if there were times when she regretted that. All so that the younger, her favorite, would get the blessing. What, what did she get from, how did she benefit from that? Did she? I don't think so. Manipulation, deception, all for your own good, never works. That's a little discouraging, but it all works out in the end, okay? I'll say that. You know, Jacob does have this encounter with the Lord, and he comes to a genuine change, a conversion. He becomes Israel, um, and he gets a dose of his medicine. He begins to put off. He begins to put off the generational passage of this deception and this manipulation and the conniving. He's a changed man on his way back to the land. Okay. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that it is not our responsibility to fulfill your words of prophecy. It is your job, and you've got it well covered. And Lord, I pray that if there's any areas where we're stumbling into uh, manipulating people or conniving or, or being deceptive, Lord, I pray that you call us to account on that. We quickly put it off. I thank you that you're in control of all things, that, that it really doesn't rest on us, it rests on you. And so, Lord, I, I thank you that it works out in the end, but, Lord, I pray that we'd see that there's a steep price to pay to manipulating other people. And uh, I just thank you for who you are and your great love for us, and thank you for the fact that you are coming soon. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.